Hey, everyone. Uh, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming out uh, first thing in the morning uh, to hear my talk. Uh, how to become a space hacker. Let's hack outer space, the final frontier. Uh, my name is Mike Caprio, and I am a software developer, uh, an instructor, and a community organizer, uh, like many of you out there in the audience. But since I first became involved in space hacking uh, just three years ago, I've been an advisor for NASA and the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and was selected for a brainstorming team focused on rallying the world's resources to defend the Earth from asteroids. And I'm here to tell you that you, too, can become a space hacker. I'd like to start with a short video from an event we organized earlier this year. My name is Katie Coleman. I'm a NASA astronaut. And I am here at my very first space apps competition. And we've done some great solutions in terms of getting the data down to the Earth that we need to understand the Earth, to understand exploring space. But we can't analyze it all. And we need people here to help us analyze that data. My name is Matt Thompson. I'm the general manager for technology evangelism across the US for Microsoft. The reason why we're here fundamentally is because we believe innovation happens in organizations like this. People come together to solve kind of multi-dimensional problems. We want a thousand great ideas to get started. We love to hack, so we're here just helping people build on their ideas. Hi, I'm Ron Guerin. I'm a former astronaut. I became involved with the Space Apps Challenge for a number of reasons. One is the solution to a lot of the problems facing our planet our technical solutions. But I think more important than that, the collaboration itself is an incredible asset. It's an incredible mechanism for us to put the pieces of the puzzle together, really, that will help us solve our greatest challenges. You've got resources, we've got coaches, you've got skills that people are getting, you've got hard problems, and you have people who have a passion for solving. I'm involved with this because it's so exciting. It's so exciting to see what comes of it. And not just this weekend, but what comes after this weekend. You know, what grows from the seeds that are planted here. Things are happening at this Space Apps Challenge. So since 2012, NASA has annually held the International Space Apps Challenge, a mass collaboration focused on space exploration that takes place over a weekend at locations all across the globe. It's the largest hackathon in the world, and it's a completely locally organized, grassroots volunteer event. NASA puts forth the challenges and provides guidance, but all the funding, logistics, and solution making is done by unpaid volunteers. Anyone from the general public is invited to attend, and NASA requires that no admission be charged for attending. I had the privilege of organizing all four events in New York City with the help of local nonprofits, and I'm proud to say we've established an 1,100-member space hacker community uh, with around 300 members active in a meetup.com group. Um, actually, let me put back the other slide, in case you didn't get the uh, info there. Um, NASA chose New York to be the global main stage for space apps in 2014 and 2015, and this year was our most successful year yet, with nearly 400 people attending. In addition to our annual hackathon, we also hosted NASA's first Women in Data boot camp, aimed at increasing diversity and participation in hackathons, and our inaugural space conference of renowned speakers, all of which you can find on YouTube at the Space Videos link at the bottom of the screen. Um, this year, we were invited by Microsoft, our uh, top-level sponsor, to their headquarters in Times Square, where they gave us two floors of the building all weekend long for the hackathon of the conference. We had people lining up as early as 5 a.m. to take part, and our space hackers produced close to 30 projects, with one of our teams producing a global prize-winning solution. So I'm just going to show you a few of NASA's own slides uh, on their mission briefing for the statistics of space apps. You can see this year's participation was completely overwhelming, uh, truly worldwide participation, and a great deal of it right here in Europe. Uh, this page, you can see the explosive growth of the event over four events in a three-year period. Uh, 2,500 projects, open source, public domain projects, have been created in just three years. <clears throat> and tens of thousands of people have taken part. And we're not just talking about techies. Uh, only about a third of the attendees self-identified as uh, software developers this year, and the rest were a broad mix of diverse, interdisciplinary people. Space apps is in many ways a misnomer, as it's not just about apps, and it's not all about space. Many challenges have to do with solving problems right here on Earth, 
regarding issues around climate, agriculture, and clean water. Solutions to challenges can involve robotics, data visualization, hardware, design, and educational curriculums or displays. This diverse mix of people is exactly what NASA is looking for. They want to crowdsource new ideas, and they want them to come from voices outside of their mainstream. And this is why they initiated their Women in Data boot camp and followed it up with their Data Knots program. I'm proud to say that Space Apps NYC has been gender balanced and diverse from our very first event, and we were even able to provide on site childcare this year for all of our participants. All the solutions built at the event must be submitted under an open source initiative license that permits the free and open dissemination of the work. Just like everything else, <laughs> thank you. Uh, just like everything else NASA produces, all the projects created at Space Apps must be placed into the public domain for anyone in the world to use for any purpose. You can access any of NASA's resources at the four sites here and use their software, data, code, uh, any imagery for any purpose, even commercial purposes. So you might be thinking to yourself, okay, well, a space hackathon is pretty cool, but do you really get to work with NASA? Well, the answer is yes, you absolutely can work with NASA. Teams from all over the world over the last three years have been approached by NASA after space apps and have even been offered the potential of contracting to continue their work on their projects. So I'll offer the recent ISE 3 reboot project as further proof to show that NASA is happy to work with outside parties. Uh, if you didn't hear about this last year, a small team of space hackers, led by Dennis Wingo, uh, raced between ground stations all over the world in an attempt to salvage an abandoned NASA spacecraft from 1976 that observed the solar winds and was redirected to fly through the tail of a comet. Uh, Dennis Wingo is probably the ultimate space hacker. He specializes in resurrecting decades-old technology, and he does it with small teams of so-called amateurs. His team reconstructed a radio using GNU radio software to reestablish contact with the ISEE-3, and he was able to execute several maneuvers with it, but ultimately discovered the craft had lost its fuel and the team could not bring it back to an orbit around the Earth, or into the Lagrange points. Um, but as long as his team was able to continue meeting gating requirements that NASA had established for their mission, NASA continued aiding their effort and working with them. NASA wants to work with the public and wants to further commercial space initiatives. And you can see that video at the link at the bottom there on YouTube. NASA will even launch satellites for you. If you meet the requirements of their CubeSat launch initiative, they will launch a CubeSat for free as an auxiliary payload on one of their regular missions. The CubeSat design is a modular system, 10 centimeters on a side, that can literally contain any kind of equipment up to a designated weight. A variety of types of CubeSat have been successfully launched using equipment like Arduinos and smartphones for computing power and all manner of sensors and systems. You may have heard of Bill Nye the Science Guy. Uh, he had his recent light sail Kickstarter project, uh, which is testing the use of solar power for propulsion of CubeSats. Uh, the slide is a little bit out of date, actually, since his light sail campaign raised something like a million and a half dollars in crowdfunding. But it's not just NASA who's looking to collaborate with the public in the exploration of space. Last year, Space Apps NYC was approached by the American Museum of Natural History to help them organize their first ever overnight hackathon, Hack the Universe, in the Hayden Planetarium. The museum wanted to innovate and make its data available for participants to make open source visualizations and tools that would ultimately become exhibits or research aids. I have to say there is probably nothing cooler than space hacking next to an actual meteorite. Uh, this was only the second time in history that the museum allowed adults to stay overnight in the museum. They fed us, they gave us uh, places to sleep. And uh, of course, if you need to hack through the night, there's only one beverage of choice to drink, and I made sure it was there. <laughs> Mixed reaction, yeah. It worked. Uh, about 30 projects were produced in just over 24 hours using the museum's known universe API, which you can actually access yourself at the URL below. Another project uh, that the Museum of Natural History has been working on in collaboration with Linkshipping University in Sweden is an open source suite of space simulation tools called OpenSpace. The museum wants to grow an open source development public community around these tools, which can be used on any platform to render actual simulations of outer space, as recently occurred during the New Horizons flyby of Pluto. Who wants to make a space game on a VR headset? 
Anybody? Uh, so I'm going to show another video. And this is an actual demonstration of the open space suite uh, showing New Horizons uh, when it did its Jupiter gravity boost. Whoops. Ah, no, I went ahead too far. Uh, this type of imagery was actually used, or I'm sorry, this type of simulation was actually used by PBS. Uh, NASA used it themselves for uh, the um, Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins when they did a simulation of the actual moment of Pluto flyby happening at the Museum of Natural History. Um, they had this great um, event called Breakfast at Pluto. Uh, and here you can see that uh, they're using actual NASA telemetry, so they're using what they call a spice file to position the satellite exactly, uh, the spacecraft exactly in space, and then the actual images that the spacecraft took, uh, showing that, that field of view there when it uh, did imaging of the Great Red Spot as it did its flyby of Jupiter. And they did the same thing for Pluto, except they didn't have the imagery yet, so now they can actually do the same thing and create simulations of Pluto with the data that's coming back from the New Horizons spacecraft. You can learn more about open space and take part in its development by signing up for the AMNH mailing list at the link here or directly on the Linkshipping website at the link below. So lastly, I'd like to mention that true to the mission of NASA's incubator innovation goal uh, with the Space Apps Challenge, I'm in the process of creating a space technology accelerator in New York. Uh, I'm calling it Empire Space Labs. And I'm currently working with a stealth hardware startup and a company called SpaceVR. Uh, SpaceVR is launching a 3D, 360-degree virtual reality camera to the International Space Station and is currently running its own crowdfunding campaign to pay for the launch costs. The successful launch of Overview 1 into space will be a turning point in the new era of virtual exploration of space, allowing anyone with a smartphone, tablet, computer, or VR headset to experience what it's like to be an astronaut. Space VR is working with NanoRacks for launch services, with Made in Space to 3D print the housing of the camera on station, and an ISS astronaut to assemble the camera and film content with it. If anyone here in the camp has a VR headset, uh, I would be happy to hook you up some really cool footage uh, that is unreleased that Space VR camera has actually taken so far. Um, so I want to invite everybody to come hang out in the Space Village. Uh, we can, uh, we're going to have a party on Saturday night. Uh, you can come by and buy a model rocket, check out some awesome do-it-yourself space hacker projects, and chat with us about the future of space exploration. Uh, we'll be having a party on Saturday night with free food and drinks sponsored by Space VR. Thanks for coming out. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, we have about 15 minutes of Q&A. We have two mics. There's one stage right and one stage left. If you have any questions, just go to the mics, queue up, and I'll tell you when it's your turn. Anybody? It's really early. <laughs> We're all still waking up. No questions? Question. Okay. Can you go to the mic, please? Thank you. Hello there. Uh, thanks uh, very much for the talk. It was really cool. Um, quick question. What would you say would be the maybe most important, biggest, or, or whatever challenge you think people in this room could have a go at trying solving in space? Really interesting question. Um, I would say, so, so this year, the International Space Apps Challenge actually had four themes of challenges. Uh, Earth, space, humans, and robotics. Uh, they identified these as the main themes of the challenges. So, you know, humans in space, uh, you can talk about things like medical breakthroughs or studying uh, different types of conditions that astronauts go through in space. So bone loss, uh, understanding things about medical devices, doing testing of stuff in space. Uh, right now they have the year in space uh, program that Commander Kelly is doing where they're going to test the changes in his body over the course of a year. Um, you could potentially design an experiment that could be sent up to the space station that would help test 
uh, these medical conditions. In fact, NASA, through their nonprofit arm, CASIS, uh, CASIS is the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space, and they're another avenue that people can work with to get free consulting to get their stuff onto the space station. Um, they're specifically looking for organ on a chip uh, proposals right now. So if people want to do testing and remove for the constant of gravity in their experiments, they could do stuff uh, for medical advancements, uh, testing in space. Uh, just as one example for humans. Uh, robotics, obviously, there's all kinds of need for uh, different types of uh, robotic applications, both on Earth and in space. Uh, this year, Space Apps Challenge, uh, Space Apps in Cyprus, uh, which held a very successful event this year, was also chosen for uh, a, a prize for their drone development. Uh, they built a 3D, 3D or laser cut and printed a drone that both had feet uh, to actuate on the station and uh, propellers for uh, motion through the station. So uh, just multi-purpose aid for astronauts in space as a robotic uh, assistant. Um, yeah, I mean, it literally, any challenge is sort of out there for people to work on. Um, a lot of them are really important. I don't know if I really want to prioritize any one over the other, um, but those four themes are kind of the areas of interest that we're exploring right now. Stage left, please. You. Hello? Yeah, okay. Um, when you organize something like a space apps uh, hackathon, um, where do you get the the expertise from, because you know, I, I've, mm -hmm. I've been considering doing something like this for high school kids, mm -hmm. uh, simply to get them opened up for, you know, pursuing an, an, an opportunity in aerospace. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, but it's very difficult. I mean, I live in Belgium. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to find experts who are willing to volunteer time and know-how certainly uh, and you know well just getting a few noobs into this and teaching other kids is not well may not be responsible uh, I will say um, you know it, it takes time to grow community as well um, even though in New York we have 1100 members now our first year we only had about 80 signups and 40 participants so it's the kind of thing when you start small and then you kind of grow out and the same is true of getting mentors We've had mentors who have come in uh, like the second year and have come back every year afterwards. Uh, you know, we have astrophysicists. I mean, people who are at local universities, folks who are engineers, uh, you know, just mechanical design people. I mean, really anyone can mentor anyone else. That's kind of the, the whole point of space apps is that anyone can come and try to work on these problems and they can share their expertise and share their knowledge with each other and, and almost kind of self-mentor. Um, you know, same kind of principle with like a hackerspace. Uh, so, you know, if you are lucky enough to have a real domain expert in space or in biology or, or in whatever in your area, um, you know, I mean, just keep reaching out. I mean, eventually you'll find folks will, will everyone gets excited about space. Um, so yeah, when you reach out enough, long enough uh, and enough times, you'll get people that will be interested. Yeah, stage left again, please. It's, it's kind of a related question. It's the same question with... Um, if you want to host a hackathon, say in Amsterdam or on the European soil, because a lot of the resources are US-based, um, does, does one contact NASA or is it through ESA or what is that process? I might have missed that early on in the talk. Sure, sure. So the Space Apps Challenge, uh, you can go to spaceappschallenge.org. Uh, that's the main website. It is global. I mean, the, the, the application process happens. Uh, it will be happening probably in early fall this year. Uh, you just go and you fill out a form and you say, I'm interested in hosting in this area. If there are already other people that are hosting, NASA takes care of the job of connecting you with those people. Um, so uh, you're basically get, you get all these great organizational resources. You become part of a community of space apps organizers who are connected through uh, like IRC or Skype or they, they host global calls in multiple time zones. Uh, it's really, it really is an amazing, fantastic effort on their part. Um, they're working with a public-private cooperative, uh, cooperative agency called Second Muse uh, to sort of help them with all the, they contract out to them to help them organize uh, on the ground. I mean, the, the whole point really of the Space Apps Challenge is it acts as this separate entity that is not truly NASA, but is affiliated in a sense. It's not sponsored by, it's not backed by, there's no material support that comes from NASA, it's just a mandate 
and the challenges themselves, which get sent out, and then it's all grassroots, locally organized. I mean, we have sites that are, I mean, New York is one of the biggest sites in the world, but we have sites that are just a bunch of folks in a hackerspace that are hacking on something really cool, and they're just, they're treated as equally as any other site in the world. So. Any more questions, anybody? No? Okay, then please thank Mike again. Thanks, everyone.